technology industry, certainly telecom, and is no stranger to this area. By a show of hands, how many of you at one time in your career worked at Nortel? Oh, well, there you go. Welcome home, Matt. <laughs> Matt Desch was the president of Nortel Networks in his heydays in the 1990s. He was involved in Tech Titans, uh, back then known as MTVC, and spoke uh, at this luncheon, I think about 12 years ago, you said, Matt. Um, and so we're very glad to have you uh, back uh, today. He is currently the CEO of Iridium Communications, a uh, satellite uh, company. When he took it over, uh, I think they were coming out of bankruptcy. And he's turned that company into a leader in providing mobile satellite services for maritime, aviation, government, and the Internet of Things solutions. Uh, Iridium is currently in the middle of a $3 billion network transition with 81 new satellites launched by SpaceX. And I was enjoying his uh, stories last night about dealing with Elon Musk and SpaceX. And they're going to have a new network launched in uh, 2018. You know, I've seen a lot of odd, and I'm sure you have too, about the resurgence in uh, space exploration, mainly led by the private sector. And Iridium is certainly uh, one of those leaders. Um, maybe he'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges in that. We had a conversation again last night about space junk that I found rather interesting. Uh, he's going to describe the Space 2.0 race and the implications for how the new race will be, uh, what it will mean for global communications. Uh, he is a graduate of Ohio State University. Do we have any Buckeyes here? Uh oh. <laughs> That's okay. I think Matt can hold his own. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matt Nash. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, it's really great to be back here. And uh, it's felt a little bit like old home week here in the last day. It was great having dinner with some old friends. It's great to see some friends here to come uh, and watch me. They've seen me before and they're back here today. That's such a good sign. I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I did spend you know, a house here in Dallas area. In fact, only about a quarter mile from here, just up in Preston Trail uh, for over 20 years. Moving out, I think, about five years ago. And I'm living in D.C. now, but I do miss Dallas. I do think an organization like Tech Titans is unique in the world. Um, certainly the relationship, not just between the city and business, but also UTD and, and, uh, and the educational groups. I've worked in New Jersey and experienced there, similar thing in Northern Virginia, and I really think you have something special here that you should continue to nurture it. I was pleased to be part of that early days as, the, as this area was starting to form. It doesn't, I, doesn't, I don't recognize it anymore. It's crazy uh, what's happened here, but you know, congratulations to all of you who've reformed and restructured um, the area the way you have. So, I just want to talk about space. I was a telecom guy who escaped, okay, and I moved into space. In fact, that was part of my thesis for going to Iridium. I had been in the equipment business for my whole career. I got tired of competing with China and India and downsourcing and, and uh, commoditizing. And I really wanted to go someplace that hadn't commoditized yet and had high barriers to entry, like billions of dollars because they built too, too expensive of a network. And I found it in Iridium uh, about 10 years ago. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Iridium. It is a very interesting and unique company. But I'm then going to move into sort of what are the biggest opportunities in space because there is a resurgence right now of, of the investment boom that happened during the 90s that created Iridium is happening again. I think I'll talk about that. I want to give you a little bit about what some of the challenges are of building a business in space, not literally in space, you don't have to work there, I mean it, it runs in space, okay? Um, and they're not calling it this new space or space 2.0, I think new space is the official term of what this investment boom is. And I'll talk about some of the companies that are in that space and some observations and hopefully I'll move through pretty quickly because I really would love to get some of your questions and talk about what you find interesting. So just about us, we're just a quick snapshot, we're a public company on NASDAQ, we have a, a more than 850,000 subscribers on our network, doing over $434 million. You can see our operating margins are almost 60% because that, that delivers $254 million in, in operational EBITDA. Uh, satellite companies, satellite operators eventually become mature and throw off lots of cash. The problem is you have to spend a lot of cash to eventually throw off a lot of cash. We're just getting to that state. 
Our network is quite unique. There isn't another one like it yet, um, though there's some that want to build like it. When I'll talk about the history, but it's 66 satellites in low Earth orbit. Each satellite goes around the Earth 14 times a day, 17,000 miles an hour, about every 100 minutes. It's, uh, they go on a conga line of six planes of 11 satellites. The name Iridium came from when it was seven planes of 11 satellites. That's 77, that's the atom, is Iridium. Unfortunately, 66 is Dysprosium, which is a terrible name for a company. <laughs> so they decided to keep it Iridium. Uh, we're the only company still that uses those little links between the satellites. Those are RF links that means we're kind of like a mesh network in space. So we don't depend on ground infrastructure because whether you're at the North Pole or in the middle of the ocean, we can relay your call to wherever you need to go or back, back to you. So it was a, the original idea was conceived all the way back right now almost 30 years ago in 1987 at Motorola in Schaumburg, uh, Illinois. Um, I don't know who that was, but that was the old logo. Um, this is what the state of technology was in 1987. Um, I know some of you I'm looking at here may not have been born in 1987, though a couple of us I know have been in 97, but you remember the Motorola cell phone or the shoe phone. You know, there was no internet, it was Apple HyperCard, remember that, just in terms of storing information. Uh, ship phones, the air phone that was up in the bulkhead there on the, on the airplane, and an IBM PS2 was the state of the art. So that's what it was. So the concept about having a phone that worked everywhere on the planet, and I love all the marketing pictures that I pulled from those days. It's always some business person coming off a jet. I guess they thought there were millions of us coming off a jet. Or, Africans sitting in the middle of no communication showing how this was going to change their life because they were finally going to get communication for the first time. And in 1987, that was probably not that crazy of a vision. Problem is it took 10 years to get the service online. That's the problem with big capital investments like this. It was, wasn't launched until 1997, so our satellites will be 20 years old in two months. Um, over $6 billion was spent. Very little of that, by the way, was by Motorola. Almost all of it was other people's money um, as they created partnerships around the world in all kinds of countries. There were over 90 satellites were built, which was crazy in the satellite industry. There was only probably a, a thousand satellites total, and they were gonna build almost 10% of all of them as had been built in the previous 40 or 50 years. Uh, they IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange with a $10 billion market cap. Of course, we all had one of those. I mean, that's not a big deal in the 90s, right? Um, crazy, they launched all these satellites in one year. That was unheard of from three different locations in Russia, China, and, and the US, and uh, really generated a lot of excitement. And others, like the president of Nortel, who said, what a stupid idea, uh, as I spoke around in my wireless forums, because I thought the technology was amazing, but to put $6 billion and expect to make $6 billion back didn't make any sense, and guess what? It didn't. Um, however, it did spur kind of a space race. There were all these companies that got formed at the same time in the 90s. I only bring this history back up because it's happening again, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Some of you might remember Teledesic. That was Bill Gates and Craig McCaw's company that my former president at Nortel left to go run, which made the job opening for me to run. Uh, so I, I thank him for that, and I thank Teledesic for that, the day before I ever moved over there. Uh, but, you know, when, when Motorola was building this, they were already building two more satellite networks that were going to be the replacement networks for it. I mean, that's how, that's how everybody's mindset was, which, by the way, is very similar to today. Here's what our services were at launch when we finally got to 1998. A $3,300 satellite phone. I think uh, we have one of them over here, actually, if anybody wants to see one. Uh, as a, uh, you, you rarely go to some place where one of the original employees actually is here in Dallas who can, who can show us there. But there were commercial services with a pager and a phone, and then there was a private network built for the US government for the DOD to use. Um, needed, you know, so, just remember, those of you who've been in the wireless industry know this pretty well. In 1989, when Iridium was conceived, versus 1998, when, when Iridium was launched. In 1989, this is about the time I joined the wireless industry. It was probably about 1990 or something. I think I moved to Richardson. There were 7 million subscribers globally. 
that had a cell phone, and you could see the phones, like the MicroTac, which you got 75 minutes of battery life for almost $3,000, or a transportable car phone. So you could see how this vision might make sense at that time. But by the time the system was launched, we had the StarTac for 995, and all of us had a Nokia 8210, I think, didn't we? Um, so, and there were 600 million subscribers, so you could see the challenge of this system at the time. So, of course, six months after launching the service or so, gaining 30,000 or 40,000 customers instead of the billion that they needed, a uh, million that they needed, the uh, company went bankrupt, and, and, uh, and that should have been the end. So, my first observation to you are space businesses are very exciting, but failures are, uh, are spectacular. And, uh, we were a spectacular, and I say we, in a sense of those of us all feel like an alum, alumni of this, this group. Um, it was a big deal. It was the largest bankruptcy in US history. They were fortunate that one month later, Enron happened. <laughs> and it's true. It was like the shortest lift uh, of being that level. And I can, I can imagine the Motorola executives just thanking Enron for having a big year disaster. And of course, we remember MCI WorldCom and all the other things that were happening at that time. So it was still very embarrassing. It was a challenge. Um, it's all been written in a book. We talked about it last night. Um, it's called Eccentric Orbits. John Bloom wrote it last year. He's getting a lot of awards for it. He's an independent writer, so spent seven years on it. I recommend it. It's got a lot of warts. It's got all the good and bad stuff. Uh, I don't show up until page 300, so if you want to skip ahead, uh, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, so it was originally, it was um, bought in 2000, about a year after bankruptcy. It was a, it's all documented in the book by a group of investors for about $25 million. They only had about $12 million of their, in cash, so they had to use a note from Motorola for their main here. That's how, that's how toxic the company had become after being the biggest blowout of its time. Um, turned cash flow positive in 2003 when it didn't have to spend. It didn't have a, uh, I think the original kind of um, cost structure was a billion dollars a year. You know? So when it turned that into $150 million a year, it didn't take long to start becoming profitable. Uh, I joined in 2006 as CEO. I was the sixth CEO in six years. You can tell how toxic the company might have been. Uh, we went public in 2009. We started. Fi we financed our next generation replacement network. By the way, those of you who aren't in the satellite space industry, satellites last about 12 to 16 years, 12 to 18 years, typically. Ours are 20 years, so I thank Motorola for the good work that they did in making them so flexible, but we are needing to replace them, and unfortunately it's a, it's a very expensive system to replace, but it's very unique, and remember my original thesis, do something very different than anyone else does, um, so we kept doing it. So, everything starts with our, our um, network. This is, uh, this is too faster than they are, but you can see how the satellites move around the Earth. Uh, footprint under every part of the Earth. We're still the only communication company that runs something under every every inch of the planet. And our business isn't just voice anymore. It's voice and data and IoT and broadband and all kinds of other unique services that takes advantage of it. In fact, we went from that big phone that you saw showed over there to lots of other devices. We moved from basically being a direct to customer with zero partners, now over 350 companies build us into things, a Garmin, a Honeywell, a Caterpillar, we'll put it on everyone, Walmart containers track, are tracked by us, uh, push to talk services, all kinds of stuff, but I'm not selling you stuff, we'll move on. Um, we do cover the planet. This was one week of commercial traffic um, sometime a couple months ago. You can see voice calls with M to M or IoT calls, Internet of Things type devices, but you really can see everything. I do notice these, see those wavy lines in the southern part of the hemisphere? That's actually Alistair Westgard, for those of you who know Alistair. That's Google Loon, uh, balloons that are commanded and controlled but using Iridium satellite links. So what is Iridium Next? This is our next generation satellite system. Uh, it's a $3 billion system. This time around we're using half of it's our own money and our own cash flow, so we, are, we have had to finance half of it. It's higher bandwidth and capacity. We'll be able to go from our data rate today is 2.4 kilobits per second. I mean, that's really how we did voice and short burst data. We'll be able to move to a megabit per second or more. Um, I'll talk about briefly, we have a new business from hosted payloads, a little white part on the 
satellite, the bottom of the satellite, um, and it's launching in 2007. In fact, the first launch was January 14th, uh, just a little bit ago. It was awesome. I can talk about that, but um, yeah, we have time. I did, I did want to maybe show you this. This just gives you an idea of what launch is like. Coming to you live from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, where preparations are underway for the launch of Iridium Next, the world's largest commercial satellite constellation. Seven more launches 
in 12 months. So on the biggest customer, SpaceX, um, we have eight total launches. We do 10 satellites on each launch, plus one of them is a ride share with NASA for five satellites, so 75 total. We'll be going up by the middle of 2018, completely replacing our network. Lots of cool stuff. How do you do that? How do you, what do you do with the old satellites? Can go to that. The new satellites also will track airplanes. Remember MH370? So every airplane will be, their position will be relayed in real time. Uh, that's working really, really well. In fact, this is uh, just with one payload on one satellite over a number of passes. This is how many airplanes they saw around the world from that one payload. So with 65, 66 satellites, they'll be able to provide real time every airplane everywhere in the world for better fuel efficiency, et cetera. That's a whole billion dollar new business. Um, so that's already, and I'll be glad to ask, answer any questions about that. Let me just talk briefly about Space 2.0 and where we're at. Um, after Iridium cratered along with a whole bunch of other companies, we went through about the same kind of nuclear winter that Telecom went through for the 2000s. Um, very little investment from about 2001 to 2010. We were probably the spike in 2009 and 2010. And then in 2015 and 16, more has been spent really right now, mostly by billionaires it seems like, because this is Jeff Bezos and Google and and Elon Musk, but there's a whole bunch of other people like Mazda Sun at SoftBank and a whole bunch of other people kind of going after this business or putting a lot of money into it. Uh, not, not broadly invested, but uh, VCs, there's some private equity firms involved here, but for the most part it's, it's led by some individuals. Just, you know, what are the kind of things we're working on because there's this revolution in small satellites versus the bigger satellites. Ours are about the size of a Mini Cooper car a little bigger than your table here. That's small from the old days. These days we're talking refrigerator size or like mini refrigerator size or even down to CubeSat type. But taking pictures is clearly one of them. That's not what we do, but there's a lot of companies involved in taking pictures. I had a bunch of things that you could show up, but the big ones that I, I'm interested in that you'd be interested in is providing more enterprise-like bandwidth, literally what you're comfortable with getting on an LTE or 5G in remote locations, uh, whether that's on in airplanes, cruise ships, or oil and gas people, as well as what they call the O3B, other three billion people who don't have access. Um, this seems to be a problem for Facebook and Google who need more customers, and that's why they want to find people to click on links in remote places. So those are the key problems that people see and this boom is really going towards. What are the challenges of doing that? Well, there's, there's more than four, but these are the four key ones. First, it's expensive. And we're trying to lower the costs, but it's still expensive. These entities really to do that still are billions of dollars, which means you spend all that not knowing if you've developed a competitive business. Uh, fortunately, with these smaller satellites, maybe you can get into business a little bit earlier, but it still takes quite a few years. Launch availability costs, we'll talk about who's doing something about that. When I, um, my contract I mentioned last night with SpaceX was for that time seven rockets for $450 million. My next closest choice to SpaceX was 1.25 billion. So that's what the cost of putting stuff in is in that billion dollar for something like this. Well, you gotta bring the cost way down because that's almost a third of the cost of, of building a business. Regulatory issues, spectrum, everybody's moving up. The nice thing about us in, in uh, the satellite business is we get free spectrum. We don't have to auction it. We would never have a business if we had to pay for it. But people are trying to exploit that by getting spectrum up in the microwave bands to, to use that now on the ground. But then you have to worry about terminals and that sort of thing. And then as I said, I think you saw a time to market's a really big deal. So what are the technology disruptors? Well, these small, I hate the word disposable because that means that they're going to be create debris that's going to get in our way, but uh, that is a big new thing. Reusable lower cost rockets. Uh, we were Leo before Leo was cool. I remember getting in 10 years ago and people said, you're Leo, you know, that's, that's where people go bankrupt. Geostationary, which is the belt at the, you know, 15,000 miles away, that's where it's all happened. Well, now it's all in Leo. Everybody wants to launch a Leo. Uh, phased array technologies, a couple companies in the way of doing that. 
reprogrammable payloads and sensors versus exquisite devices, smaller subsystems, hosted payloads like what we did for the aviation tracking, and very high throughput satellites. So those are some of the disruptors. So who's involved in that? Well, the biggest one, of course, is SpaceX. Um, you saw them, they came in, reusable rockets. Sorry I didn't show you the landing on the barge, but I hope you've all seen that, it's really cool. They're gonna have the Heavy is gonna launch soon, which is three rockets together. All three of those are gonna land, how cool is that? Um, but they, you know, we launched from Vandenberg out in the West Coast. Most of their stuff launches from the Cape. Uh, SpaceX wants to build 7,000 satellites too, and blanket the Earth with a low Earth orbiting system, which Elon supposedly believes will create $30 billion of revenue for them. Don't believe it, but it, it's, uh, it's what they're going after. Virgin Galactic, uh, <laughs> rockets launch from airplanes so that you don't have to worry about a, a base. And also space tourism is another sort of thing that's <laughs> interested. Um, smaller rockets, this is a New Zealand company. Uh, he's the founder of it. They're gonna launch their first launch, I think in a couple weeks here, uh, called Rocket Lab. Uh, Blue Origin, this is Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame. Uh, he just announced at the satellite show a week or two ago the new blend, and you can see how big it is compared to everything today. It's almost as big as the Saturn V rocket. Uh, if that new blend three stage goes, it actually, it's, it's reusable too. That will land on a moving ship. It's all, it's all about Roger stuff, come on. Um, here, here's a company taking pictures, Planet, uh, with lots of these small satellites called Doves. Uh, they want to do real-time pictures. They want to be, you want to be on your iPhone to say, I'm really interested in what my cottage, I think there was a storm up there for 50 bucks, I want a picture of it right now, and they can deliver a picture in, within 30 minutes to you, that kind of thing. Or, or taking all this information into a real-time database and put it with all kinds of other information sources to learn new things that are valuable. Um, Google Loon, I mentioned the one that uh, a local person here went off to, to run and uh, I don't know how successful it'll be, but they want to provide Wi-Fi from, from balloons. Um, this is the big one. This is the one that everybody's talking about. OneWeb is a startup. Um, they're investors. They have the biggest Series A ever. Uh, investment by Airbus, Qualcomm, Hughes, Coca-Cola, Barty, um, Total, which is a uh, South American company, that's really what their network is going to look like. Almost 660 satellites in low Earth orbit providing broadband connections. Um, you know, 300 spares, very low latency. They want to be able to make satellites like uh, uh, like five a week. You know, about the size of a small refrigerator. Um, million dollar satellites with a five year orbit life, ours is a set of 20, with five terabits a second total network throughput. Could be the new coming of Teledesic, the new coming of the bubble. Uh, some new phased array technology that's coming to support companies like that. This is just a list of the LEO filings in the last three months. 18,000 satellites have been filed for. That's nothing more than has ever been launched, ever. Um, and you can see the numbers on the SpaceX at the top there, but Boeing, OneWeb, Kepler, um, Telesat Canada, a whole bunch of others. Uh, I have no idea. The problem for us is all these are different than us, so I have to constantly explain to investors why LEO doesn't equal competition to Iridium. These are partners to us because I didn't go into all the detail, but we do things a very different way, and we're really more of a a connection to these kind of people. So I don't fear them. I can tell you I don't think any of them are going to happen in any kind of time frame that any of them tell you it's going to happen. And I'm not sure they're going to be business successes, but there's going to be a lot of investment and excitement and you know going after uh, building new satellites to do all kinds of interesting things. So a couple key observations. Um, it is very fun to be in the space business. Um, physics, you can actually explain to your mother what you do. Uh, <laughs> You know, blinking lights in a Cisco router, I'm sorry guys, it's Cisco. There is no way you can explain inter internet protocol uh, or optical uh, <laughs> optical technologies or whatever to your, to your parents. Uh, you can when you can show them videos of stuff blowing up. Uh, there's a lot of uh, excitement, there's a resurgence of interest in space, but it could be the start of a bubble. 
we're one of the, what I would call the first successful new space companies in the sense that we're we're now successful in doing a lot of the things that some of these companies are doing, but we, we're an overnight success story that only took 30 years to get here, right? So uh, we're a cautionary tale. Unfortunately, I don't know that people are listening, and, and this one web is somebody you should probably watch because they're kind of in a category all their own. So, about what I thought. So, uh, could I answer any of your questions? Yes? So you can keep a call, in fact, every, uh, if you make a call or you have a data session with us, every, you know, you're getting a new beam on the satellite, it's handing beam to beam on the same satellite about every 20 or 30 seconds, and every uh, six to eight minutes you get a whole new satellite. So it's a little bit like cell towers that are flying by you, you're standing still, but the cell tower is going by and you just hand off one by one to them. So it's, it's seamless, you can keep a call up for hours, you know.
However, I'm sorry, thank you. That day, uh, you have a lot of pollen here in Dallas right now. <laughs> um, so that day, we were, so all the potential conjunctions were in this sort of, it's called a space catalog. We were number four or five on that day. That's why he looked at that list. But we were never moving satellites in those days because uh, the information was plus or minus like a kilometer, and which is just who knows which direction to move then because you probably could be making it worse for yourself. So we had never moved before that. After that, they decided to make that catalog very, very accurate to the point you literally know within a meter of where something's going to be one, two, or three days from then. Now we communicate, we have the right kind of information, we're moving satellites all the time. So good news is I don't think we're going to hit much else. But it's a lot of work, and I don't want to make it any worse. Um, there is something called the Kessler effect. Don Kessler at NASA postulated that if there's a chain reaction that could occur, that if enough stuff runs into it, then you have more stuff that can run into more stuff, and then suddenly we can't even launch any more satellites, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, I was telling last night the story. I emailed, I just one point, because I was worried about this, and I emailed don.kessler at nasa.gov. He emailed me back in two minutes and said, I have been looking for you. <laughs> I want information. I want information about how you're performing in space. We need to do better. And, uh, and so we've been very, very active in the debris. I am very worried about it. There is no rules. There are, the rules are, uh, and by the way, there's only, and these only were created about five or six years, maybe 10 years ago. It used to be, you didn't have to take your stuff out of space. It was almost like if you got done with your cup from uh, McDonald's, just throw it out your window of your car because it's a big deal, you know? Uh, somebody maybe will eventually come along and pick it up. Uh, our satellites, even as low as they are in Earth orbit, take over 100 years to come down on their own. That's why I love these people who say, when your satellites fall out of the sky, I wish, it, you know, you, stuff would fall out, it goes very slowly. So um, the rules, 25 years, you have to deorbit your satellites, but it's a guideline. So um, we're gonna deorbit our, these satellites that we're replacing within one year. So we have enough fuel, and we've been storing enough fuel, we're gonna get them out of space really quickly. We just don't want to be in the way of anything. Um, but I'm really worried about these small satellites that aren't as smart as the satellites we have because everybody's got the Silicon Valley mindset and says, let's do things faster. So what? They don't need to last for 15 or 20 years. That's the old way. They can last for five years. Well, we've had 10 of our 80 or 90 satellites become rocks, as we call them. That's what happens when they just, you can't talk to them anymore. Well, there's nothing you can do about that anymore. What if 10 only 10% but one of 900 satellites become rocks. That's 90. I don't think it's going to be just 10%. It's going to be 30%. So I'm worried. But I'm going to be in the industry another five years. I know I'm not. Gonna be. <laughs> I, I worry for all this, so long term. Um, yes, sir. I have read that there's an issue with technology having been lost during that route that you showed us. Technology lost, or anybody lost. We don't oh. remember how they did that before. Do you think find that to be true? And if you do, what opportunities does that represent? I certainly, as you can tell by the people losing their minds, filing for all these satellites, we've lost the what happened in, in 19 in 1990s that sort of created the nuclear winter to begin with. Um, that's certainly true. I don't know if we've we certainly lost a lot of people out of the industry during those days. There were rockets that they decided not to pursue any longer. There were satellite systems not to be pursued. Uh, I'm sure that happened, and, and I think that slowed things down. But on the other hand, some new a lot of new companies have come in, employed people, are inventing new things. And, and in some ways, one of the reasons this resurgence is happening is because of the technologies that we're all creating in many other industries, cell phones, et cetera, are coming to bear. Um, so I would say that I, I do think the deep space stuff, of course, we've, we don't know how to go to the moon anymore. We don't know how to take risks that way anymore. Um, Elon Musk wanted to go to Mars crazy. Um, if, you, if you've watched the series, the Nat Geo series, I don't know why anybody would want to go to Mars uh, or the Martian or whatever, but still that aspirational big leaps and stuff, I think we're, we've forgotten how to do that very well and I don't know that we have a plan or the will as a, as a country to do that sort of thing right now. Uh, I hope we get it back. Thank you. Matt, question. Go back a 
So yes, um, making all those satellites, and we're almost halfway through the 81 satellites. We'll have them all done by the end of this year. Um, you know, that was a big expense. It doesn't cost much to ship them two by two to California or anything, but then you put them on a dispenser and you put them on the top of the rocket and that whole thing is, if you will, is one eighth of my whole budget going up at one time. That is a very expensive 10 minutes, I have to tell you. Yeah. Very expensive, very exciting 10 minutes as well. George. It was a failure venture by me because my CFC of A question about uh, some field venture about LTE. Yes, in fact, is you know we're a proprietary system technically today, so it's a special um, mechanism. TDMA is our proprietary standard, but the desire really is to have an LTE smartphone and everything use it. Today we supply a small Wi-Fi hotspot that's a satellite device that uses a SIP client that you can get off the Apple or Android phone and you can use it in your iPhone and you can call through the satellite phone so you can put that in your boat and go down down below where it's nice and warm and you can call and six people can use it. But you know, more, I'm sure OneWeb, when they make a system in that small, small town in Africa, it will be LTE to mobiles and it will be standard technologies um, to other devices. I doubt it will be core LTE all the way through the network, but I, you know, perhaps it is. I don't know. Yeah, and probably not in space. You know, I don't think you'll have your cell phone be able to truly connect to it. We used to have dual mode phones that had a cell phone in them, and a, that sounds like the greatest thing ever. But that's not very good when. After you spend millions of dollars to develop that device next year, the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 9 and the iPhone 10 comes out, so you can never keep up with that. I've always believed those technologies should coexist because you really don't want to put them together. Uh, but yes, it sounds great to have a cell phone that works with a satellite. Well, do you really want your battery draining all day long looking for a satellite 500 miles away? It, it's never, it wasn't a business that could make sense. Yeah. Um, yes, so we're here. Yeah. So it, yeah. do we see threats from the expansion of LTE? Um, yes. I mean, uh, um, cell phone networks cover, I believe, today about 11% of the planet surface, maybe 12%. That's up from maybe 9 to 10% 15 years ago. I believe someday it'll get all the way to 13 or 14 percent, but it's still, a, you know, that leaves us with an awful lot out there. But that's a very valuable edge that we're talking about there between 10 and 11 percent and the rest of the world. Those are places where you might want to use the system. And the, pro the bigger problem for us isn't the location where LTE is, because it's, you know, every new network, I mean, just look at 5G, it's not going to get built remotely. It's going to be built in center cores and stuff. So that's not what really affects us. It's that the cost of data is falling so rapidly. You can get gigabits, terabits for almost